welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast, brought to you by the last man standing with loserpool.com. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simu, and on this edition, we'll be looking back at the narrow victory over Watford at Vicarage Road. We're recording this 10 minutes after the game's finished, so expect uh, plenty of raw analysis. Um, and of course, I'm joined by a fantastic guest. Joining me on the line is the brilliant Chris Davison returning to the show. Chris, welcome back to the podcast, mate. How have you been? It's been a little while, hasn't it? Yeah, thanks, Harry. Yeah, thanks for having me back on. It has been a little while. Um, uh, it's been good, you know, uh, trying to keep up with Twitter work and stuff like that and uh, trying to bear with some of the Arsenal performances in recent weeks. But uh, a good and important win tonight. Absolutely. It's not always been great. And tonight, in in all honesty, the performance wasn't great, was it? Um, let's Let's delve straight into it. We are recording this, as I said, 10 minutes after the game's finished, so lots of raw analysis, raw opinions. We haven't had time to watch things back. We haven't had time to read press conferences. We're straight into the mix this evening, um, and, and Chris has kindly joined me to uh, to conduct this review. So let's start off with Unai Emery's initial team selection, Chris. Um, he went with Bernd Leno in goal. He went with Mustafi at right-back, Koscielny alongside Mavropanos, and Monreal at left-back. The surprise inclusion being the young Greek defender. What did you make of that when you heard he was in the starting eleven? Um, well, initially, I sort of, uh, an hour before the game, I saw obviously the people saying that he was he arrived at the stadium with the squad. Um, and I, I did think then that there was maybe a chance that he'd start. Um, considering, obviously, Socrates' uh, suspension, um, it, I wasn't overly su- surprised. But um, I think... Uh, you know, he he didn't obviously last very long. He uh, came off shortly um, after the second half had started, um, so it was it was sort of refreshing to see him included because I think he'd been impressing um, for the under twenty threes and uh, obviously in training as well. Um, so not overly surprised um, to see him included tonight. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest, I was surprised, and and the reason I was surprised is. You know, a lot of people talk about this kid and and that he should be in the team more and that we, you know, should replace Mustafi with him and things like that. And I get it. There's optimism around a young player. That's a good thing. Of course it is. But for me, Mavropanos hasn't proved a thing yet in an Arsenal shirt. You know, he had that good mm. performance at Old Trafford last season. He then had that game against Leicester where he was sent off. I was I went up there that night as well. Um, and then, you know, he hasn't really played much in the first team since then. And so for me... I think the hype around him is a little bit premature. I didn't think he was great this evening, but I didn't think he was terrible either. He was taken off in the second half. I think that was tactical maybe, or was it maybe because he'd been out for a long time? What's your take on it? Um, Probably tactical. Obviously, we made all three changes tonight in the end. Um, So I'd say it was probably tactical. Um, Like you said as well, I think, you know, it was one of those games he had where he wasn't, um, he wasn't great, but he wasn't awful. I think, he um he read the game well a few a few uh, times, but he also made a few a few risky uh, choices and decisions in there. Um, so I think it was obviously more important to get a bit more experience on the pitch and to maybe change shape and formation. Um, with obviously that only having that one goal um, at that stage in the game still um, when when they when they took him off. So I think it was probably tactical more than anything, um, and it was obviously a. I think 50, 55, 60 minutes to see what he, he's made of really since, you know, those uh, appearances he'd made last season. Yeah, absolutely. And then, of course, Granit Xhaka returned to the midfield. And, you know, Granit Xhaka always divides opinion, doesn't he, amongst the Arsenal fans. I, for one, was glad to see him back. I think he gave us a bit of steel in the middle of the park, a bit of physical presence. He recycles mm. the ball a lot better for me than certain other players do in there, uh, like a Matteo Guendouzi, for example. Uh, what did you make yeah. of Granit Xhaka's performance this evening? Yeah, I think it was um, noticeable that against Everton that we, we missed him that that, that day. Um, and he does bring a sort of different presence in that midfield. You know, he holds the ball up well, he passes it around well, um, and he, he, he's obviously not afraid to get stuck in either. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think it was good to have him back tonight. I thought he'd done OK. Um, uh, conducted himself well, played well. Um, and yeah, I think it's obviously a big boost to have him back in. Absolutely, absolutely. Aubameyang led the line, Mikitari and Iwobi either side. I kind of expected that, um, given mm. we were away from home and that Emery likes those two in that sort of fixture. Um, but, you know, the game started and, you know, Arsenal didn't start particularly well. I know 
it wasn't long, obviously, before we broke the deadlock. But, you know, I, I was yeah. sitting there in front of the TV. I didn't go tonight. I was watching it on the TV and I was sitting yeah. actually next to my wife and I, I scared the shit out of her, to be honest, because <laughs> when uh, when Aubameyang, when, when the ball went back to Foster and there was a little bit of play around the Watford penalty area, I was screaming, close him yeah. down, close him down. And Aubameyang closed Foster down and lo and behold, he kicked the ball against him and it went in the back of the net. And it just goes to show, doesn't it? What a bit yeah. of hard work from a uh, from a striker can do. You can really put players under under pressure, can't you? Yeah, you can, and especially with uh, Aubameyang's pace that he has to offer. You know, he's obviously one of the, the uh, fastest players that we have, um, quickest players in the Premier League, and um, yeah, I think you know he's a really good, uh, an ideal player to have uh, to do that on the pitch, closing down players um, quickly. Um, and he, yeah, he done that really well on Foster tonight, and uh, yeah. Uh, Subsequently, the the goal came out of it and uh, good finish. <laughs> yeah, great finish in the end. Um, then, of course, Troy Deeney was sent off. Um, this is mm. one that's divided opinion. For me, there's no debate about it. For me, it's a red card. And, and my mm. reason for that is, is simple, really. You know, Troy Deeney in the past has spoken about the need to get in and amongst Arsenal players, the need to bash into them, let them know you're here. And that's yeah. exactly what he was doing, wasn't it, to Lucas Torreira. So... He's come in from behind with the intention. I'm not saying he's gone there to break his nose or, you know, inflict major damage, but he's gone there with the intention of leaving something on Torreira to intimidate yeah. him. And, you know, fortunately for us, the linesman has spotted it. And it's as simple as that. Yeah. It's intentional. That probably happens way more often than it should. But credit to the linesman, he picked it up. What were your thoughts on the red card? Do you agree with me? Disagree? Because um, I know Watford feel really hard done by about it. Um, I totally agree with you, Harry. I'm watching it back right now on the TV. Um, and I'm, I'm actually quite surprised that um, even a few of Arsenal fans uh, are disagreeing with the decision and say it was, it was harsh. Torreira's got the ball and he's, he's, Torreira's played the ball. He's already passed the ball to another Arsenal player. And it is after Torreira has played the ball... Um, Troy Deeney goes in with his elbow, for, you know, pushes his elbow towards Torreira's face, and for me, you, you just cannot do that. It's it's reckless, it's dangerous, it's a stupid thing to do from Deeney, um, and, and a red card for me all day long. And I'm I, I can't obviously I know everyone's entitled to their opinion, but I can't see where people are coming from when they say it's a harsh decision. Yeah, absolutely, and you know, but after that, Watford still were playing really well, weren't they? I still thought that they looked the most likely to score the next goal. Um, but mm. it, it appears that they kind of ran out of steam, uh, you know, by the break. Arsenal made a change at half-time. Of course, Mesut Ozil came on. Do you think that change made a difference? Yeah, I mean, I think um, Arsenal were keen to get try and get the, the second goal um, to make it more comfortable and more calm. Um, and obviously, we, we, we had a decent... Um, decent lineup going forward in the end uh, Zola Aubameyang with Katerin on the right uh, Wobiel on the left um, uh, you know it, it looked quite decent and I was confident we'd try and get a second you know get a second um, but uh, we, we just weren't able to, to take all of our chances and uh, Watford also um, defended well now and then um, I think Mkhitaryan for me tonight was really 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 disappointing um, and he obviously had a couple of great opportunities to to um, put us two up, but just wasted them. Um, and even though Aubameyang did did get the goal, I think obviously he had a, a couple of more ch chances as well. So it was a little bit disappointing to see um, some of the opportunities we had not taken. Um, yeah. Uh, but um, you know, obviously we we got the three points. That's that's all that matters for me. That's right. I mean, it felt like Mikitarian was almost trying not to score. <laughs> I mean, with some of those <laughs> yeah. shots. But... Were awful, weren't they? Um, Unai yeah. kept chopping and changing things, though, didn't he? He brought Ozil mm. on, he brought Maitland Niles on, he brought Genduzi on, and the system kept changing. I'm not a big fan of changing systems frequently during games because it was like we went from a back four yeah. to a back three and then back to a back four again. For me, I, I don't yeah. like that. What, what's your opinion on that? I feel it's a little bit unsettling and a little bit risky, if I'm being honest, in a game as finely balanced and as finely poised as that one. Yeah, it's. it's I, I know what you you mean. It's not ideal. It's not ideal. You want to go into a game and you want your ga your number one, your plan A um, game plan to work. Um, and obviously, I think 
uh, it, it, the red card um, tonight helped obviously massively, and I think um, if if Deeney was still on the pitch for Watford, it could have been a different story. Uh, personally, I think, but um, you know, I think we were trying to get this second goal, but we knew that Watford. Every time Watford came forward, they still looked a threat, to be honest. And I think we we just had to try and maybe find the right balance between the the, the attack and, and having some solid players at the back for us as well, and sort of a box to box midfielder, if you like, as well. I know Ramsey went off. Didn't I totally agree with that, but um, you know, obviously he's a decent box to box midfielder. Um, but Gwen Doos, he uh, done well when he came on. I think he um, he broke broke up play well um, and also looked a threat going forward. Shame he couldn't uh, square that ball um, to us. I think it was in the last couple of minutes of the game. Couldn't get any height on it. Um, that was a shame. Um, unfortunate. Um, but no, I mean, I know what you mean, Harry. It's, um, like I said, you want to you want your number one and your you, your plan A. Um, to work for that 90 minutes. Um, I think obviously you'd, you know, you'd like to think, and it should should be the case that Arsenal and uh, Unai Emery and the squad um, work on multiple scenarios in the training ground um, for different outcomes during the games and a plan B, um, C, etc. So um, you know it's not ideal, like I said, but um, it seemed to have uh, to done the job tonight. Yeah, I mean the overall performance wasn't good enough again. And, no. you know, like you said earlier on, the result is the most important thing. Of course it is. But these no. away performances are a real concern. And I no. cannot put my finger on what is so different about playing home and away. Because it feels as though when we play at home, we're full of confidence. We're ruthless. We go into no. games, you know, expecting to win. We put teams to the sword. And then the minute we go away from home, everything seems like it's being done at half pace. Like we're sluggish, yeah. we're, you know, I, I can't quite put my finger on it. What do you put this away form down to? I've heard people talking about, you know, it's a hangover from Arsene Wenger. To a degree it is, but on the other hand, yeah. Unai Emery's been here all season. It hasn't improved much. So, no. you, know, it, you know, Arsene Wenger ultimately lost his job for not doing yeah. well enough on the road. So I'm not saying for a second that I want Unai Emery to lose his job now, but what I'm saying is... Mm what is the reason for this? Why has Emery even come in and still struggle with the same issues? Well, the, one thing is for certain, it's got to improve next season um, 100% because it's cost us a lot of points. And I, th I think, obviously, if we, we picked up more points on the road this season, top four qualification uh, would have been a bit more easier. Um, and it's a little bit tight at the moment. You know, we're talking about Man City, Liverpool, Tottenham, uh, Liverpool all going away this season and putting in some really, really good performances. And that's, you know, there's a difference in class at the moment. You know, these top the top four teams at the moment, well, actually, I can't say top four teams because now we're in there, but, you know, the you know the, the, the teams that have obviously been doing really well for most of the season have been getting really good results home and away. And that is a difference at the moment. And I think, obviously, like you said, a little bit of a hangover from the, the Wenger, Wenger era, maybe. I think, yes, OK. I don't. I honestly don't know, Harry. You, you'd like, and I, I would have hopefully, because I, I mean, when we talk about last season, the, the away form was 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 pretty bad, um, and um, you you would have hoped that Emery would have maybe changed and or improved something in in that respects. Um, so, it, yeah, it's it is concerning. It's got to improve. Um, and I think the answer to that will be obviously more hard work on the training ground. Um, but obviously, a, a, maybe a couple of more defensive um, signings for us in the summer as well, because the defence again tonight was shaky at times. Every single game we have our moments at the back. It's an area that has got to be massively improved for me in the summer, if we, if, especially if we've got to have any chance of really given the, the top four a good go every season now and competing with the very best. Absolutely. For me, and, and this might be a little bit controversial, I feel as though Unai Emery's negativity away from home has kind of added to the whole mental block that our team seems to have. Because, you know, it's true, isn't it? We've gone away from home and we've set up in a completely different way most of the time to the way we've set up at home. It's clear that he prefers certain players on away days. Like Mesut Ozil, for example, is more likely to start a home game than an away game. And it feels to me as though, you know, we're playing well. You've got a system. Yeah. Implement it. Give those players the belief to go on the road and do the same thing. Go and take the game to Watford. Take the game to Huddersfield. Take the game 
you know, to, to Burnley in a few weeks' time. Take the game to Leicester because we are Arsenal Football Club. That's my, my kind of issue with Emery at the moment. I feel as though he's kind of got this defeatist attitude towards our away form and he's just like, well, you know, we're not going to win. We're not very good away from home. So let's be a little bit more conservative yeah. and, and that might work. And I personally think that's the wrong approach. And, and you know... I've been slated all season for, you know, even questioning Unai Emery, so I don't want to go too much into it. But, <laughs> you know, I, I think that plays a part. Yeah, I mean, it's it's such a... I mean, everyone can have a different opinion. Um, and, I, you know, I, I respect yours. Um, you know, and everyone's got their different ways of looking at it and the reasons for a waveform, reasons of this and that. You know, I, we, look, we're, we're not... We're not seeing what we what, what the manager sees, are we? At the end of the day, in training, in the dressing room, etc. And there's That's obviously, you know, there's 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 obviously <laughs> Emery's seeing what we're not, and at the end of the day, he knows these players better than any of us. You know, let's face it. You know, he um, he sees them every day in action and training. Um, he's got his ideas that he has for for. Um, Every every single uh, game um, each week, and he'll you know he'll put the the starting eleven out of which he feels is best suited to that game. You know, I, I, the thing with Özil is Harry is that we know we know that he's a top top class player. He's played at the highest level with Real Madrid. He's one of the best playmakers in the world. We've we're, we're very fortunate to have him um, at the club, um, and I think people feel as if he should play every game. Because of because of the player that he is, because of because of his name, and I just think that maybe you know we need to trust Emery a little bit more um, with with his decisions. I mean, yeah, okay, I've got to agree with you because I know you've said this before as well that some of Emery's decisions have have raised our eyebrows for, um, this season, and you know, you know that's fair enough. Um, but <laughs> it's a difficult one. I, I mean, I, I do get your point, and I get some of the you know some other fans' points, you know. Um, what is Emery doing with this? Why is he doing that? Why is he starting him? Why is he taking him off? Um, but we've just got to trust him a little bit more now, I think, um, because overall, he's done a great job this season. And um, I didn't even think I'd be sitting here today talking to you, Harry, with only a few more games to go this season, um, You know, speaking about the possibility of getting Champions League football next season. I didn't even think I'd be in this position. I thought it was going to be a repeat of, well, not a repeat of last season, but a, a similar uh, finish uh, position wise to last season um, but better performances if you like but overall it's been a bit more positive um, it's just obviously this away form we need to sort out you know I'm looking at the screen now Wolves away Leicester away um, but even Burnley away they're all games that we're gonna we're gonna struggle against we've obviously got to take this big opportunity against Palace coming up um, at home to get the three points um, hopefully from obviously tonight starting tonight through to that Palace game and then through to the final uh, four games of the season, we've, we're high on confidence because we've got these a couple of wins under our belt and we can finish the season on the high. Absolutely, absolutely. And Chris, a, a question that's come up on, on some other podcasts I've been on of late, uh, on the same old Arsenal in particular, um, mm. a couple of the guys were saying, would it be a miracle if Arsenal finished in the top four this season? I don't think it would be. And my reasons are because, uh, you know, we're up against the Chelsea side, who, in my opinion, are very poor under Maurizio Sarri. That move hasn't quite worked out for him or the club. Yeah. And then Manchester United, remember, this is a team that sacked their manager around December because he was so bad. They were 11 points behind us at one stage. So if we do finish above those two clubs, for me, that is not really overachieving. That's kind of doing what we should be doing. And, you know, Arsene yeah. Wenger lost his job because he was underachieving. Unai Emery needs to, you know, do a certain level, well, perform to a certain level to keep his. So I don't think it's a miracle. Would you say it's a miracle or was it really unlikely in your eyes that this was going to be the situation? I wouldn't say it would be a miracle, but I would say it would be very impressive if we could finish in the top four. I think... Obviously, you raised a couple of good points there a moment ago. Chelsea, overly very disappointing and poor this season. Um, Man United, obviously, changed managers halfway through the season. Um, first half of the season was very, very poor for them. Dropped a lot of points. 
Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, Solskjaer's come in and done a, a, a fairly decent job so far. Um, but, you know, so obviously you're taking that into consideration. Um, but it would still be impressive, you know, Unai Emery's first season to come in uh, and work with, um, even though obviously I know we got a, a few names in the summer, but to work with overall a, a very imbalanced squad um, and to finish in the top four um, is would be would be great. It would be fantastic, and I'd be very very happy uh, with that, of course. Um, so yeah, not a miracle for me because we know we've got quality players here, and we know mm. we know what we're capable of, you know, and uh, um, uh, you know we we know that there was going to be a little bit of optimism uh, and a, a little bit of improvement um, with the new manager in charge this season. So, yeah, not not a miracle for me either, but um, it would be very, very impressive. Um, and obviously it would give the club a massive boof, uh, boost Sorry, uh, financially and, and for the morale around the place. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, it would, it would just be really, really impressive. And I think everyone, every single Arsenal fan, will be absolutely over the moon um, that we're even... You know, even in that position, um, but obviously, absolutely. absolutely, you know, gonna gonna, you know, keep my fingers crossed because we're not there quite yet. There's uh, some very more, you know, very uh, important games coming up still. That's right. By my calculations, we need to win four of the last six to do it. Mm. Um, but you know, I, I could be f- three tough away games as well. It's not. It's not going right. to be easy. <laughs> That's right. I mean, right, Chris. Now that our heart rates have calmed down a little bit. Um, you know, mm. I'm still pinching myself. Arsenal won away this evening. Um, <laughs> so, you know, let's go to some of our listener questions. We've got quite a few, actually. We put a tweet out uh, just a few minutes before the game ended, uh, asking people to get those in. So uh, in the interim, we've had quite a few come through. This first one comes from Mike Hertz. He says, do you believe the EPL schedule is taking its toll on Genduzi and Torreira? Neither of them have played this many games at this level before. What's your take on that, Chris? Uh, well, it, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be because, um, you know, obviously they've been training for a long time now to, to be in shape, be in good form, uh, to, to, cope with, um, to cope with this amount of games now. And I think um, Torreira is a really, a really good, um, you know, he's a workhouse, isn't he? You know, he's, he's always running. He's always uh, yeah, high intensity. Um, he's very energetic, so I think a Torreira will cope well. I think Gwen is um in good physique, you know. I think he should be coping well as well. I mean, obviously, Torreira obviously got the suspension, didn't he, for his red card? Um, and I, you know, I think we missed him really um, at times. He's a he's a very important player um, for us, and uh, I think he was good again tonight. Um, and Gwen Doozy, obviously, there's going to be times for Gwen Doozy where he's a little bit missing match because he's he's still young, he's still learning, um, he's obviously still, he's still um, developing as a player. Um, uh, I think it would have been for, it, out of the two, Gwen Doozy would struggle the most this season. I, I knew that already, really, because Torreira has played at a higher level than Gwen Doozy, and yeah. obviously because of the age difference as well. Um, you know, Gwen Doozy coming from uh, Liga 2 and from France and playing in the Premier League, playing quite a few games. It was always going to be a little bit tough for him, but, you know, he's going to keep getting uh, better. He's going to improve because um, he's, he's already impressed me this season uh, quite a lot. Um, and he's a, you know, he's a, he's a tall, tall, tall uh, boy who will, um, who, who's got good physique, strength for this Premier League level, I think. Um, and I, that will only keep better, hopefully. So, yeah, I think, obviously, with, with a tight schedule coming towards the end of the season when you're still in the the, the, uh, the Europa League, obviously, we've got a game Thursday. It's not ideal. And I think it goes for all of the players that they might be a little bit um, tired. Um, but, uh, obviously, you can't really use that as an excuse. Um <laughs> But no, you know, we'll see. We'll see come Thursday. That's it. That's it. Exactly. Uh, the next question comes from Guna82 on Twitter. He says, is Emery rotating a lot with Napoli in mind? Well, I'm going to answer this one. I think this is really simple, this one. Um, uh, thanks for your question, mate. But I think Unai Emery absolutely had uh, Thursday on his mind. And, you know, some yeah. of the substitutions he made just highlighted that even further for me. Um, I think you'll see the wing backs reintroduced on Thursday against Napoli, I expect Maitland Niles to play from the start, and of course Ser Kalasinac to come back in as well. Um, so 
yeah, I, I think it was absolutely uh, on his mind. Jack Killam asks, uh, what do you think we need player-wise for us to have a proper chance at a title challenge next year? Chris, just briefly, positionally, what areas do you think we'd need to strengthen in? Uh, Centre-back. Yep. Um, probably left-back, maybe. Um, Ramsey replacement and a winger. Okay. Um, and if if Welbeck leaves, I also think we'll need another centre forward. But that's obviously an if. Yeah, of course. Um, I think that it'll be very difficult for Arsenal to challenge for the title. And I'm not being pessimistic, but yeah. we're not going to invest this type of money that Manchester City have invested. Unfortunately, we don't have the type of assets that Liverpool had that they then sold and managed to strengthen with the result in fun. So I can't see us closing that gap anytime soon under this current self-sustaining model. That's not me being negative, but I don't think we have the firepower, uh, sorry, well, the pocket power, I should say, to attract the type of players that we would need to make that much of a difference. That's just my uh, take on that. Uh, Chris, Melvin Marks asks, uh, as happy as he is about the result, does tonight confirm once again that certain players in this team just aren't good enough? Well... Yeah, probably. Yeah, it does. I mean, for me, Mustafi, you know, I, I don't like, so you've probably seen before, Harry, you know, the type of guy and supporter I am. I don't like, you know, publicly like, uh, um, you know, getting on players' backs and slating them, et cetera. Yeah. But I, I personally feel, you know, um, that he's, Mustafi is not good enough for this team going forward for next season. Um, Mkhitaryan, for me, is or should, probably shouldn't be a starter next season either. Um, and they're just a couple of names, you know, I think that have been overly a bit more, you know, di more disappointing than, than uh, pleasing, uh, put it that way. Um, Koscielny, who has been absolutely top class for this football club and puts his heart, well, you know, wears his heart on the sleeve. Um, and he was really solid again tonight. I think, you know, he's probably coming to the end now. Um he could be maybe a decent backup option for us in the coming seasons, but I just want to see a solid centre-back partnership, um, you know, Socrates and a, a, another top-class centre-back to come in. Um, and then I think Rob Holden can obviously be a, a top, top player for that as well. Um, so, yeah, there, there is players in there, Harry, that, that probably aren't going to be good enough to take us forward from next season. And uh, Mkhitaryan, Mustafi, uh, just a couple of them. Um, and I'm not saying Koscielny isn't good enough because this season he's been good, but I just think next season we'll need some fresh legs in that defence um, to, to take us forward in the coming years. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with you. Uh, the next one comes from Jonathan R on Twitter. He says, Hi guys, love your show. Do you think this scrappy performance away from home could be a big confidence booster for our remaining away fixtures? Or did we just get lucky today with a poor Foster decision and playing against 10 men for 80 minutes? Should we still be concerned? Um, I'm going to take this one. Jonathan, um, I totally get what you're saying. The performance this evening was not convincing in the slightest. But my biggest disappointment from the Everton game last weekend was that I wanted it to be the stepping stone going into these last few away games. I wanted it to get to be the game that got that hoodoo off of our back, that whole mentality around not being able to play on the road. So I hope it's going yeah. to do confidence. But I, I think most sensible Arsenal fans can see that there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, and, you know, that, that goes without saying, in my opinion. Uh, a comment comes in from MB Guna again from Twitter. Uh, a vital three points, but the struggle to kill this off might just be damaging for our confidence ahead of difficult trips to Leicester and Wolves. So MB Guna is looking at it from the other perspective. Um, so the second scenario that Jonathan came up with, that this could be damaging. I don't think any victory is damaging. That's just my opinion. Um, yeah. You know, so... Uh, you know, I have to disagree with you there on that one. But of course, thank you for your comment and for getting in touch. Uh, this last question that I'm going to put to you, Chris, it comes from Hezekiah Too Good on uh, Twitter. He says, and and this one made me laugh when I read it. I laughed out loud initially. Will Iwobi ever have an end product? <laughs> um, <laughs> I think obviously yes hopefully <laughs> I, I know where he's coming from um, there's we've seen you know a few times in the past Wobi's had some 
efforts um, and they haven't probably gone the, the way he wanted them to. Um, and I think at times tonight, Awobi, I think Awobi had a really good game tonight, by the way. And, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not slantering him or whatever. You know, I think there's just times with Awobi where I'm watching him and I'm, I'm thinking, go on then, do something. Go on, do something. Beat the player, you know, just do something. Create an opportunity. He created opportunities last night, which we probably should have, uh, um, you know, dealt with and, and uh, scored from. Uh, especially that the, the the chance for Mika um, for Mkhitaryan, sorry, um, not a bad save from Foster though. Um, you know, but obviously he, he's going to. He, we keep forgetting Awobi's still fairly young as well. You know, he's going to keep improving. I think Awobi's um, been a, a, a massive improvement compared to last season. His his, um, his performances in previous seasons. I think he's done really well this season. Um, so yeah, obviously there's just a few things he needs to work on, and I'm I'm confident that he's got the talent there um, to to improve on those things and uh, become a better player. Yeah, I mean, never, I don't think, have I ever wanted a player to succeed more than Alex Iwobi, but he just frustrates yeah. the shit out of me. If I'm being totally honest, you know, it's yeah. no, I know what you mean. Yeah, it, it, the amount of times this evening, for example, he received the ball on the left, he stands up the fullback. And then he doesn't know what to do with it. It's that hesitation, no, exactly. isn't it? Beat the yeah. guy, step inside, have a shot. It's that indecisiveness that causes him to end up essentially doing nothing most of the time. Um, I think that's where. I think that's where. Sorry, Harry. I don't mean to uh, no, interrupt. Fine, I just ahead. think that's where. I, I just think that's where Reese Nelson can come in and maybe make a difference next season because I think Nelson's a bit more of a, a a player beater in that respect he's good at he's good at running rings around players you know we've seen that in the, in the Bundesliga this season and when he's played for the under 23s in the past I think Reese Nelson's got a bit more confidence of beating players if I'm totally honest um so maybe maybe we might see that with Reese next season if he's given a chance you know but um regardless I still think maybe we might need another, another winger just for extra depth yeah I mean fingers crossed Reese can come back and do the business um as I was saying yeah. earlier on Twitter today uh, you know, I want him to do well as well, but has he done enough to... My issue with young players is this. Everybody loves to see young players come through at a club. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. The problem you have now in modern football is somebody like Unai Emery, for example, who, as we know, he's been given a three-year deal with the option to terminate it after two. Does he have time to wait for these players to develop? And, and this is not just a problem for Unai Emery. This is a problem across the board. Do managers at big clubs have time to wait for players to develop? They want guaranteed solutions. And, and that's what mm. that, you know they tend to spend their money on. So uh, that's my only thing. And I hope Reese Nelson comes back and does a fantastic job. But the reality is that we haven't seen enough yet, I don't think anyway, at this level to make no. that judgment. It's a hope rather than an, an expectation, I would say. Yeah, yeah, no, I totally agree. I think obviously Reese Nelson's got the talent um, uh, to be a top top player. Um, he's he's obviously done he's done well in the, the the Bundesliga. I think he obviously he got left out a few times, didn't he, recently? But he obviously come back the other day and, and got a goal. Um, so it's it's going to be a decision. I think Unai will make obviously pre season come next season. Um, uh, to see to see if he's you know if he's improved and if he's if he's going to be good enough. Um, so yeah, it's going to be an interesting one to see uh, to see how you know how it pans out if you like. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just some comments that have come out from the manager's interviews since we've gone and on air and started recording. Javi Gracia saying that it was no way a red card. He says, "I respect the referee's <laughs> decision. In my opinion, it is clear." Maybe a yellow card, but never a red card. I do not agree with the decision. Troy is very sad. It was an important game for us. He knew it. The sending off was very tough for us. Well, Troy Deeney has surely now learned his lesson about speaking out about other clubs because since he's played <laughs> us uh, in the two uh, fixtures after that, he's missed a penalty and he's been sent off. So, you know, that for me um, is, uh, is enough. Hopefully now he's learned his lesson and he'll keep his mouth shut in the future just to round off Chris uh, just got a couple of stats that I'm going to throw out to you guys uh, Arsenal keeping their first away clean sheet in the Premier League season at the 16th time of asking that is incredible um, I'm throwing a party after this you don't know that I'm about to throw a party <laughs> and when I say that's incredible I mean it's incredibly poor uh, it's, it's <laughs> awful, isn't it? um, 
Uh, none of the past 12 Premier League meetings between Watford and Arsenal have ended in a draw. Uh, so that's a little interesting fact for you. Aubameyang netted his first away goal from the Emirates Stadium since Boxing Day at Brighton, ending a run Blimey. of seven games on the row. Uh, seven games on the road in all competitions without scoring for Arsenal. So that's an interesting stat as well. Um, and, of course, one in favour of Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang, because it's only fair. Uh, he was the match winner, <laughs> or his heel was the match winner in the end. Uh, Aubameyang netted his first... Uh, uh, wrong one, reading the wrong one. Uh, that's it. Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang has been directly involved in three goals in his three Premier League appearances against Watford, scoring two and assisting one. And since his debut in February of last year, he's been directly involved in 37 Premier League goals for Arsenal, 11 more than any other player for the Gunners in that time. So that's a great uh, statistic in his favour. Uh, Chris, just yep. before I let you go, of course, Napoli coming up on Thursday. Quick prediction. How do you see that one going? Uh, well, I'm, I'm f obviously after that uh, solid home performance um, last week. I'm, I'm more confident now. Um, I think, it, I think it's something. If we score one away goal, if we score one goal on Thursday, they've, Napoli have got to score four. I think it works. So, um, you know, it's we've got to try and go there and get that, get that away goal and see the get, see the game out. Um, so yeah, obviously, especially after that good game Thursday, I'm, I'm a bit more confident now. So uh, we'll see. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I could tell you going to the San Paolo is not like going to Vicarage Road. <laughs> it's going to be a very different uh, atmosphere. Don't know what you're talking about, Harry. It's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. If you can do it in Watford, you can do it in Napoli. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right, guys, that brings us to the end of another episode of the Chronicles of Aguna. Huge thank you to Chris uh, for joining me once again. We'll be back on Friday uh, to review the Napoli game, of course. Uh, also, we're putting out a bonus podcast in between with uh, former striker Marcus Gale, where we'll be discussing racism in football, a real problem at the moment. So keep your eyes peeled for that one as well. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, at Chronicles underscore AFC. Don't forget to follow Chris. Chris, what's your handle? Uh, C Davison underscore AFC. Brilliant. Give Chris a follow. He does some fantastic work keeping you guys up to date with all things Arsenal. Subscribe to us on YouTube. We're actually producing video podcasts now, finally. Uh, and we've surpassed a thousand subscribers, which to some people is not a big deal. But considering we are an audio show, and I always say this, we are very proud of that. So do uh, head over there as well for the video content that is coming your way now as well. Um, and yeah, take care, guys. Enjoy the victory. Uh, enjoy the clean sheet. And uh, we'll be back on Friday. Until then, good night.